I'm Rich Harwood. Uh, thanks for joining me for a really exciting uh, day for for us here at the Institute and and um, and for our partners and and all of you. I'm really excited about the launch of um, of our new book, Stepping Forward. And uh, and more importantly, I'm really grateful um, that you would join us for for this launch. Um, as some of you know, we've already been getting a great reception to the book. It's uh, just for pre-orders alone. We were on Amazon's bestseller list. Last night, we saw that we were on hot new releases on Amazon, which is, which is cool and uh, really excited about that. But most of all, you know, I just wanted to talk for a few minutes about the book and what we're doing with it and, uh, and how um, people across the country can use it. Um, to improve um, our shared condition and human condition in the country. I've already started a, this um, campaign tour. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was in uh, Butte County, which is um, Paradise, California, where, as many of you know, the campfire um, destroyed uh, the community of Paradise and that they're now um, in a recovery mode. I was in Sacramento. Um, the day before that at the Sacramento Public Library with our partners there. Um, I went from there to Philadelphia, and from there I went to um, Hartsville, South Carolina, a town of about uh, 10,000 people in, in South Carolina, and then off to Greenville, South Carolina, um, where we had uh, an amazing set of events with, with our friends um, there. Moving forward, I'll be going to um, Colorado Springs, Kentucky, New York, um, back out to Des Moines and, uh, and on and on it goes. And, and here's what I'm learning um, as I've been going across the country and, and talking about the book. The, the book's messages are really, are really resonating with people. Um, you know, I've been talking about the fact, as, as you know, that um, we are, at least in my lifetime, more polarized than I can ever remember. Um, we are more divided. Uh, people seem to have um, more grievances from, from all sorts of directions. Um, we are increasingly hunkered down and retreated and forming um, small circles, tribal circles, where we are sort of um, retreating into, um, where we can't uh, see and hear one another and engage with one another. And the message of the book and the message that I'm sounding across the country is that that we don't have to accept what's happening in our country today, um, that there is a better way forward, uh, a more practical, positive way forward. Um, I believe that each of us has the power to step forward um, and demonstrate that we can bring out the best in ourselves and in one another, that we can do better and be better, and that most importantly, I believe right now, that we can come together with to demonstrate that we can restore our belief in ourselves and in one another, that we can come together and get things done. Uh, in the book, uh, I lay out seven principles uh, about how to make that happen um, in, a, in a section, the middle section called shared responsibility. Uh, and in the last section called welcome home, um, I talk about what it's gonna take for each of us as individuals to step forward with um, an increased sense of courage um, and an increased sense of humility uh, to come together and, uh, and restore our belief that we can actually get things done together. But there are three, um, three points that, that I've been talking about on the road that run throughout the book that I just wanted to highlight this afternoon because I think they're so important. And as I've been speaking in different communities, it's I thought you might be interested to know that they're resonating so deeply with folks. And, and they're these. I, I think at the core of our challenge today is a fundamental human challenge. Um, yes, we need technical responses to lots of challenges that we face, but there is a fundamental human challenge that we confront. I think what people want to know is whether or not every individual um, will be afforded a sense of dignity in our society. Um, it seems to me that you know dignity is different than respect. Respect is something that you you earn over time. Um, dignity is a birthright. Dignity is non-negotiable. Dignity is part of uh, it's intrinsic to to being alive. And I think 
we often give lip service to dignity in our society. And I think increasingly what so many Americans are wrestling with is, will they be afforded a sense of dignity? Will they be afforded a sense of dignity regardless of the color of their skin, regardless of what side of town they live on, regardless of how much money they have in their bank account, regardless of the kind of car they drive or the kinds of clothes they wear? Will each and every American, uh, each and every individual be afforded a sense of dignity? The second point that I think really resonates deeply um, across the country right now, no matter where I go, um, is about hope. And, um, you know, hope to me is, is uh, not a campaign slogan. It's not something you slap on a bumper sticker. It's not some abstract idea. Um, hope to me is something very real. And I think we have a fundamental choice in our work and in our lives about whether or not we will continue to promote a sense of false hope where we set expectations that we know we ought not to set and we know we can't keep, but we, we set them anyway because somehow we think maybe we'll get more funding or more supporters or more notoriety in the media, that we make pledges and promises that we can't keep, uh, that we say we're gonna solve education problems in a community in some two year grant cycle, which we know is simply not possible. Um, so I think we have to make a choice about whether or not we intentionally and many times unintentionally promote false hope or whether or not we will actually engender authentic hope. And I define authentic hope this way. I mean, there are lots of different ways to define it, but. But one way I define it is this way. I think of a single mom who has two kids, who's sending her two kids off to public school in the morning. And when she sends them off, whether they're walking to school or taking the bus or taking mass transit, she wants to know, will today be better? Will tomorrow be better than today when their, her kids go off to school? Will they actually have a shot at the American dream? Will they be able to fulfill their God-given potential? And when I think about those two kids, I think about whether or not um, when they put their heads down on their pillows at night and they're starting to close their eyes and doze off, do they believe that tomorrow can be better than today? Or do they believe that they're going to have to endure yet again another bad day at school? And so I think we have a choice about hope. I think we have a choice about dignity. And third, I think we have a choice about whether or not community will truly be a common enterprise whether or not we will be pulling together as we move forward in our local communities and in our country, whether we will work in common cause with a common sense of purpose in a common direction, um, or whether or not um, community is only for some of us and the rest of us um, will be left out and left behind and that many of us will have to go it alone on our own. And so, at the core of the book and at the core of these talks I've been given across the country, um, these ideas of dignity, hope, and uh, communities of common enterprise have sort of um, been threads um, throughout, throughout all of it. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, there's this incredible hunger for this message. And I think there's an incredible response when um, when we begin to talk openly about the fact that the change we need in our country is, you know, I doubt it's going to come from Washington, D.C. anytime soon. Things just seem to get messier and nastier there. Um, it's unlikely to come from any of our state capitals. I actually believe it's going to come from our local communities um, where we can see and hear one another, where we can afford each other dignity again, where we can come together and be doers and create change together, where we can demonstrate what is possible, where we can restore a sense of hope in one another and in each other. And so um, people are really excited about that and uh, excited to hear that message and excited to hear um, what they can do. In a minute, I'm going to see if, um, if anyone has any questions or thoughts about the book or ways in which they're thinking about using it. I'm just really delighted that you could join us um, today, and I did want to mention one other quick thing before we before we open it up, and that is that um, it's great to write a book. It's great to go out and talk about a book. It's great to sell books, but the real reason why I did this is because um, I wanted folks to have something in their hand 
that could um, enable them to accelerate and deepen change in their own communities and give them a sense of hope that that's possible. And so when you go to our website, steppingforwardbook.org, you, you can see different ways to get engaged. Um, we have speaking tour dates all throughout 2019 into 2020 and some even into 2021. We'd love to come to your community and engage um, with you there. Uh, you can sign up to be a captain. This is really not a book tour, but a campaign about um, making an entreaty to our fellow Americans to step forward and join with one another and create communities that reflect the best in us, the best of us. Um, and so as captains, what we're really hoping is that you can take this book and use it to build allies in your community. I know a lot of folks in our network are using the book um, to talk to other people in their community about how they can work together in different ways. Um, in other communities, there are going to be book clubs that are already launching um, with hundreds of people in some places. And so it's a great way to engage people um, in a conversation about this. We'll be putting out a, um, a book club guide in the next couple of days. Um, we're going to be holding for captains. Uh, I'm going to be holding special sessions where we can talk about some of the issues that are arising as we're going across the country and some of the issues that you're facing in your communities as a way to, to bolster and boost um, the efforts that um, you're undertaking in your communities. And lastly, as captains, as we have new tools and new reports coming online, which we do have coming online in the next um, couple of months, um, we wanna make sure you have access to them immediately. And so we'll be sending them to you first as well. So um, if you have questions, um, put them in the chat box, or if you want to ask them um, verbally, just ask to be unmuted in the chat box and, and we can do that as well. And, um, and we'd love to hear um, what you're thinking about. I know Richard Taylor wrote, um, what community have you seen that is doing the best job of implementing the principles you share in this book? Um, well, I know my publicist would want me to say, well, you know, there's tons of examples of different communities um, in the book that you should read about, um, which is true. Um, and so uh, I can tell you that um, uh, Mobile, Alabama, I write about in the book, which used the principles, um, a woman named Carolyn Akers, who's a fantastic leader, used these principles to help transform schools there. There are folks in Battle Creek, Michigan, that have used this work, um, which I write about in the book about how they used it and what they produced across their community. That's another great example. Um, there's an example of a community uh, called Malambi in Australia um, that I, I write about. That's a really um, fantastic example. There's one other example I just wanna mention because I'm so delighted with the progress that they've been able to create, which is in the book, um, I actually talk about Clark County, Kentucky um, which is a partner of ours. And when I wrote the book, we were just starting um, work that has now gone on for about two or three years um, in Clark County. And it's amazing. So in the book, all I was able to really write about were the challenges, the opioid crisis that folks in Clark County face, um, the fact that kids go to a blue ribbon schools, but they feel abandoned by the community and by adults, that many faith leaders had unfortunately been sowing division and acrimony between and among themselves and within the community, that there's a history of slavery and enslavement and ongoing racism um, in the community. And so those are all the things I could write about. And then I, I talked about how one would hope a community would use our principles to address um, those challenges. Here's the thing that I just want to mention. In the coming weeks, I'm going back to Clark County to talk about the book and to release a new study that talks about their progress that's called, you know, the book is called Stepping Forward. The new study is called One Step at a Time. It documents the progress they've been made. If you sign up as a captain, I'll make sure you get the, the report um, sooner than others. But in any event, um, we'll be releasing it to our network and to others. And it's a great sort of bookend um, to the report in terms of the small rural community that had been left behind and left out, that many people thought could not pull itself up, could not create 
progress could not address the challenges that it faces. And in my speeches, when I'm going across the country, I use Clark County as the centerpiece of the speech to talk about what we are capable of, about the human spark that exists within us, within each of us, um, about the innate capacities that we have that in Clark County, the, the people you'd least expect and the combinations you'd least expect are taking the actions you'd least expect to help mo move that community forward. So I hope that helps and uh, um, both read the book about stories and uh, as well get this, new, get this new report. So let me pick up another question here. Um, is your responsibility equivalent to Peter Block's accountability, which he defines as putting concern for the whole above self-interest? Um, well, some of you know, we actually have something called the three A's where we talk about accountability, which I believe I talk about in the, in the book. And there, what we're concerned about is, um, are we living up to the pledges and promises that we make? I know Peter Block, he's one of my favorite authors. He's a fantastic speaker and even better thinker. Um, what I would say about shared responsibility is this, um, a couple of things. One is that um, I believe it's part of human nature that we all have self-interest. I write about this in the book. I believe it's part of human nature that we all have um, our particular identities um, and that the challenge for us in America today is not somehow to rid ourselves of our self-interest or to pretend we don't have different identities. Um, I think those are things to be celebrated, actually. Um, our diversity is something to be celebrated. I think the question is whether or not we can hold on to our identity and also transcend them to see that we are part of something larger than, than ourselves, that we can hold our self-interest and then also transcend them to see that we hold shared interests that we need to work on. And so in the book, in terms of shared responsibility, I talk about two things that I think are really critical. One is that I think, um, we Americans, people who are here in America, um, want to regain a sense of control, a sense of agency about our lives so that we believe that we can shape, I think we want to believe again and regain the sense that we can shape our own futures, that whether it's foundations or organizations or political leaders aren't just imposing things from the outside upon us willy-nilly out of context um, and divorced from our shared aspirations and our lived experiences. So one is I think people want to regain a sense of greater control over their lives and over their shared lives. The second thing that I think is really critical here, as you know, so many of the challenges that we face um, require a shared collective response. The, the opioid crisis that I mentioned, whether it's in Clark County or, um, or Hartsville, South Carolina, or wherever, wherever you may live, it's in, it's in so many of our communities. Uh, the fact that education requires not just a good school response but a good community response and that's something we're going to be we're working on in hawaii right now it's something that is part of the clark county work it's something that is going to be part of a new initiative we're launching um, with our friends in jackson mississippi um, we need to marshal our collective um, shared resources in our communities and so when you put those two things together i think there's a way um, to conjure up a new idea of shared responsibility that is not, and I'll just end with this, that is not just a technical response of getting the largest institutions in our community around the table or the most powerful people, but really creating a space where um, we value both large institutions and human scale actions, where, where we believe that everyone really has a contribution to make, where we know that expertise is important, but that expertise can come from all sorts of places that we never imagined before, not just those of us with certain degrees or, or certain titles um, before our names or that we work for certain institutions. And so that's what I mean by shared responsibility. Um, and uh, I hope that helps. Any other, other questions or, or thoughts, um, either about the book, about the launch, uh, about where we're going to go next um, on this campaign. Um, here's a question from Andrew Willis. How do we open the door to having these meaningful conversations and bridge gaps when we're talking with friends or family? Um, you know, Andrew, not too long ago, I actually wrote um, 
a, a, a piece on this right before Thanksgiving that um, maybe we can actually resend back out. But but here's some things that I think we need to be thinking about. One is, you know, when we're talking to our friends and family, we often take a posture of we are waiting for someone to say something that we can pounce on. We're waiting for someone else to say something that fits um, our narrative or, or biases or stereotypes about who they are. We assume when we hear them say something that we know what they actually mean by what they say. Um, and we are ready, we're getting ready to pounce so that we can, we can win the argument and win the day. And, uh, and depending on who we're talking to, maybe even pummel them, right? We've all seen this happen. We've all experienced it. We've all done it to other people and we've all had it done to us. So here's what I think we ought to be thinking about. First, when someone's talking to us, we ought to hold our comments for a bit and try to understand first what it is that they're trying to say by asking them, what do you mean by that? Um, why do you say that? Uh, second, I think we ought to be reframing our discussions around our aspirations, our shared aspirations about what are your aspirations if you're talking about a healthcare debate or about education, what are your aspirations for children or what are your aspirations for healthcare in our communities or in, or in our country so that we can begin to get at the underlying um, beliefs and things that we value in our lives as opposed to just arguing over labels over different policies um, or arguing over um, proposals from different candidates. Um, I think we ought to be um, thinking less about winning arguments and more about seeking to understand what, what others are trying to say um, and to, to join up those discussions and see where, where we can take them. I think uh, just those few steps um, would, go, would go a long way. Let me pick up another, another question here. How do we help leaders who take their sense of responsibility seriously and think decisions belong in the boardroom? How do we help them share that responsibility um, with others outside? Look, I think this is a great question. I think this is fundamentally um, uh, a challenge of whether or not leaders are turned inward or outward. Um, I was just in Greenville, South Carolina, um, I guess today is Monday. Um, I was just in Greenville Tuesday, sorry, Tuesday. I was just in Greenville, South Carolina last week um, and got asked this question. Um, so I think we have, to, we have to get people to turn outward. Now, you can tell them to turn outward, you can plea with them to turn outward, but that's much like Andrew Willis's question. It, it turns into a debate at that point. So I would rather you ask these three questions um, and I have questions like this in the book, a little different, but related to this. In that boardroom, I think we have to start asking questions about what are our aspirations for the community? Not what are our aspirations for our programs or our strategies? What are our aspirations for our community? As soon as people start to answer that question, they, they almost immediately shift their orientation to be turned outward without even knowing it because they're, they've changed the reference point for the conversation. I think we ought to ask people next, what are the challenges in reaching those aspirations, which enables people to talk about what's in the way of us achieving what is really important to us, right? And then third, I think we ought to ask, what conditions need to change in order uh, for us to overcome these challenges? And uh, what I can tell you is when board members, when staff people, use these questions, inevitably they begin to see that, that actually they hold aspirations for their community, that those aspirations are shared between and among people, that this is a conversation and a way of talking that they seldom if ever get a chance to do, that they produce um, a notion that, um, to your question, that there is no one organization, no one leader, no one group who could ever achieve these aspirations on their own. We need each other, which immediately suggests shared responsibility. And that when we talk about these shared aspirations and the challenges and the conditions we need to change with others in our community, these things immediately implicate us. They implicate one another 
And what I find is people start to raise their hand and say, you know, I could work with you on that because I hold those things valuable as well. So that's where I would start. There's a whole lot more in the book uh, about all this. And, um, and I hope you'll read it and write to me and, and, tell, me, and tell me how it goes. Um, let me uh, pick up another one. Here's one. I'm just picking up one from Hannah in Sarasota. She writes, looking forward to having you in Sarasota and Manatee counties in Florida. 20 book circles signed up and many more to come. That's awesome, Hannah. I'm coming down there um, in just a couple few weeks. Um, I'm really looking forward to being with you um, and, uh, 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 and engaging um, with folks both in Sarasota County and in Manatee counties, um, both of which I know um, you, the Patterson Foundation, and the effort you're doing aspirations to action is, is getting a lot of traction. All right, let me pick up another one here. Um, from Carlton Sears, what communities have you been to so far with the book? What do you see them doing as a result so far? Really interesting question. Um, you know, um, when I was in Butte County, which is in California, where Paradise, California, where Paradise, the community of Paradise is located, which was um, destroyed by the campfire. First, let me just say that in that community, the conversation that I had with about 50 leaders was, was really moving. We talked about what happens in a community um, that undergoes trauma, um, what happens um, to individual people who undergo trauma, um, what are the ways in which communities can begin to get on a path, a more hopeful path, and what does that really take? And so I just want to say that that that's one of the communities I've been to. I found that experience deeply, deeply moving. Um, and, uh, and my understanding is that the people who were there who are already doing good work um, are, um, I know some of them have been talking about forming a book club so that they can talk about the topics in the book in terms of their recovery. I know that there are other folks there who now want to start to work together in different ways. And honestly, I. There's some, been some discussion about even potentially bringing a public innovators lab um, out to, uh, to Butte County. In Sacramento, where I was, um, where the Sacramento Public Library has been using our work um, and it has been doing really amazing um, work with it um, in a number of areas. One area is creating new hubs for people with disabilities um, so that they can be better served, so that they can better fulfill their potential so that they can better um, utilize the resources of the library and, and fulfill their lives. Um, that, that both the speech I gave there and then the round table that we did afterwards, I always do a round table after these speeches. Um, uh, there were any number of people in that round table who sought each other out um, to begin to do work together. There were people there from the arts, there were people there who deal with trauma, there were people um, from city government who were trying to figure out how to better partner with people in the community. And so what we're seeing from these tour stops is it's catalyzing, um, it's catalyzing efforts. And one other community, which I won't name, but I met with a group of funders um, where we talked about the ideas in the book and the, the, the Institute's practice. And for them, what was really exciting was they immediately began to see the implications for um, how they might need to fund efforts differently in the community, how they as funders could be catalytic, more catalytic in the community, how the answer to all challenges in communities is not always money, but sometimes building new networks or, or helping people build capacity while they're trying to achieve something. And I think some of those funders saw ways that now they might be able to better collaborate as well. So. Um, Honestly, we haven't been to a community where we haven't seen um, almost immediate uh, immediate results um, from the visit. And um, many of the communities that we're, we're visiting, this is just sort of happenstance or coincidence, I think, um, have turned to us and said, will you bring a public innovators lab to the community? We're doing one in Oak Park, Illinois with our partner, David Seleb there from Oak Park Public Library in March. Um, that happened to be my first tour stop. And um, which was a, a number of months ago. And, um, and so there they're bringing people around the table to work on inequities in the community, on issues of inclusion, 
on issues of um, the achievement gap in education. I'm really excited about the work that David and his colleagues are doing there. So hope that helps. Let me see if there's one other um, question. Um, someone from Corning, New York. Uh, Barbara, let me just tell you, I don't know if you know this, but my daughter is getting married next weekend to a gentleman from Corning, New York. So um, who you might who you might know, the Boskets. So um, you asked whether I could repeat the title and the basic info about the book. Um, I'll do it really quickly. The title of the book is Stepping Forward, um, A Positive Practical Path to Transform Our Communities and Our Lives. Um, it's about the fact that uh, we don't need to accept the division and polarization and the hunkering down and the retreat that is taking place in our country, um, that there is a better way forward, that each of us and all of us together have the power to step forward and bring out the best in us and the best of us and to build a path that uh, where we can do better and be better and restore our sense of belief in ourselves and one another. Um, and uh, I hope you'll read the book and, and send me um, your thoughts about it. And I should also say, for those of you who read the book, um, if you can put a review up on, on Amazon, that's um, always really helpful as well. So um, last, let me take one more one more question, and then and then maybe we'll we'll wrap it up. We just wanted to spend about a half an hour today and uh, uh, with you. But it, someone says at one point, <clears throat> Brian Rubin asks, "At what point in the process does one earn skin in the game? Is it as soon as you step forward?" That's a fantastic question. Um, we just did our public innovator summit, and um, a word that I introduced there for for conversation was the word awaken, which is also the name of um, the introductory chapter of the book, um, which is called Awaken. And so I actually think that each of us, um, Brian, has skin in the game when we awaken. And, you know, when we awaken is when we, when we see something that we hadn't seen before, when we begin to sort things out in ways that provide new meaning to us, when we recognize that maybe we have a responsibility or an obligation or a stake in something, when we awaken, I think, is when we see that that action is required and we step forward to take action. So, so I think we have skin in the game when we awaken. And then when we, be, when we make the choice, and I actually do believe it is a choice, when we make the intentional choice to step forward, to turn outward toward one another, and to assume some semblance of shared responsibility for our lives together, that none of us can make it on our own, going it alone on our own, that it's not good enough for some of us to succeed while others are left out and left behind, that dignity really should be afforded to every individual in our society, regardless of their station in life and what's happening to them. It's a birthright, it's non-negotiable. That authentic hope really does matter. It's the thing that I think matters the most to people in their lives or one of the things that matters most, a sense of possibility and hope that tomorrow can be better than today. And that community really is a common enterprise. These are the things that I write about in the book that I talk about on the, on the campaign stops that my hope is you'll join with us because um, I know you know and already believe these things are important. And, um, and I'll just close with this. We can hunker down, we can retreat, we can accept the polarization and the division and acrimony in our country. And we will continue to go down a path um, that diminishes our sense of hope and possibility and that leaves far too many people behind, maybe even some of us on this call today or we can choose to go down a better path, taking a better way that builds a more inclusive, hopeful uh, society um, where we turn out, where we turn outward and step forward and take shared responsibility for our individual and collective lives. And where by building things together, we restore our sense of belief in ourselves and in one another, restore our can-do spirit 
and not only make this country better and make our communities better, but bring more meaning and sense of purpose to our individual lives. That's what I hope we can do together. That's what this campaign and this tour is about. That's what I write about in the book. That's what I hope you'll join me in doing. We don't have to accept what's happening. We can do better. We have the power to do it. Let's step forward and get it done. Thanks so much for joining us today and look forward to being in touch and, and being with you soon.